rebuked. When somebody rebukes you, how does that make you feel? Imagine some of us, we are hurt when somebody rebukes us. It does not feel good, does it? So when God rebukes you, I would ask you again, how does it make you feel when the Lord rebukes you? You see, again, rebuke is something that we just don't handle very well, do we? Many of us, we actually hate. And yes, I use the word hate there. Many of us, we hate to ever be criticized. Many of us, we hate to ever be corrected. Yeah, I tell you today that when God rebukes us, we should never think of it as a bad thing. In fact, when the Lord rebukes you, I want you to understand today that it is for your own good. So I would ask today, how many of us desire to be a better person today? How many of us desire to live for the better? In other words, I ask you today, how many of us desire to grow? How many of us desire to mature in order for us to live for the better? You see, my hope is that all of us would desire to grow. My hope is that all of us would desire to grow to live for the better. Now, in order for us to do this, in order for us to grow, in order for us to mature, in order for us to live for the better, there are steps that we must take. And I tell you today that we must take the proper steps in order for us to grow, in order for us to mature, and in order for us to live for the better. Now, the first and the only step that any of us should take for growth it should be to turn to the Lord. And as I said in my sermon last week, it should be to choose God over everything. All of us, we should choose to live by the way we should choose to live by the word of God. Choosing God over everything is a choice to live for the better. Yet when we make this choice, we found out last week that this choice, it comes with a great deal of hardships. Some of these hardships, they definitely come from things that are beyond our control. But a lot of the hardships that we find we face in life are hardships that come from within. They are personal. So as we saw last week in our Sunday school lesson last week, there is a work that is being done within us. There is a transformative work that is being done within us. And this work is being done by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is transforming us from our old self into a new creation. As Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians. You see, as we transform into this new creation, we find that our talk is changing. And we find that our walk is changing. Therefore, we find that the actions we take, they too, they are changing. They're not changing for the worse. We are growing up. So they are changing for the good. They are changing for the better. Jeremiah, he said of his transformation after consuming the word of God, that he rejoiced in his heart. He rejoiced in his soul. So for us, again, when we choose God, we are making a choice that, again, will cause us to grow up. We are making a choice that will bring joy to our soul. And this joy, again, as I said in our Sunday school lesson today, it is a joy that is long lasting. It is a joy that is eternal. It will not fade away. Yet putting off our old self. Again, we find that it comes with a great deal of struggle. We find that it comes with a great deal of hardships in our life. 
these struggles, these hardships, they, they come because many of us, we find it rather difficult to let go. Many of us, we struggle to let go of our old self. Many of us, we, we struggle with let going of our old ways. As the saying goes, old habits die hard. Got an old yes and a chuckle about that. So I imagine today that, that some of us, we understand the struggle. Imagine today that some of us, we, we understand the hardship of letting go. Yet I tell you today that those old habits, they must die. We, we must put those old habits behind us if we truly desire to change for the better. If, if we truly desire to grow, if we truly desire to live for the better, those old habits, they must die. When you and I, when we choose God, we are again making a choice to break away from those old ways, those old habits, in order for us to grow, in order for us to, to gain a wisdom. We must again make a choice to choose the Lord our God. You see, gaining wisdom it is good for growth. As Solomon said in the first chapter of Proverbs and in the fifth and the seventh verse, a wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Solomon, he said that the fear of the Lord, it is the beginning of knowledge. Therefore, fear of the Lord coming to know him it is the beginning of gaining wisdom. It is the beginning of gaining truth. Now, all of us, we must answer a question. And I tell you that it is a very important question that we must answer when it comes to our growth. The question is this. How many of us are willing to heed the truth? How many of us are willing to heed the truth, especially when the truth is coming from the Lord, our God? How many of you today are willing to heed, to listen to the truth and be obedient to the truth? Now, if that question was to be answered truthfully, then the truth would be that a lot of us wouldn't be able to stand hearing the truth. You see, a lot of us, when it comes to the truth, we are unable to bear the truth. So because many of us are unable to bear the truth, many of us will refuse the truth. We will reject the truth. We will refuse and we will reject the truth from anybody that is trying to give us the truth and we will refuse and reject the truth when it comes from the Lord as well. So the question that again rises from that is why be so stubborn? What leads us to be so stubborn that we would choose to reject the truth? Let us consider that when one tries to offer correction, the suggestion is what we will think is this. We will think that we have done something wrong, that we have messed up. And the last thing that anybody wants to do is to hear that they have messed up or to hear that they are wrong. You see, the truth is that none of us None of us like to ever be told that we are wrong. We get sensitive when somebody tell us that we are wrong. When we hear that we have messed up, we, we, we get into our feelings. We don't want to hear it anymore. Being wrong can be seen as failure. And again, when it comes to failure, that same truth, it holds steady. None of us want to think of ourselves as having failed. None of us want to fail. 
none of us want to be thought of as a failure. You see, many of us, we are unable to handle failure. Nonetheless, acknowledge that we have failed. So rather than accepting failure and being wrong, some of us, we will live blissfully in our ignorance to the truth. The person that carries on in this way, the person that refuses correction, the person that refuses to acknowledge that they may have messed up, that they may have done wrong. Solomon called them a fool and he did not shy away from calling them a fool. Are we a fool today? Will we not heed correction? See, I tell you again today that failure or being wrong should not be thought of with such a negative connotation that we often give it. You see, when I was growing up, I was taught a few things by my parents. I was taught that when you don't know something, don't be afraid to ask questions. I was taught by my parents that when I needed help, the first thing I should do is not try and go and do something myself, but to go and seek help. I was taught that when I was wrong, that I should accept that I'm wrong and that I should accept the correction that someone would give me. I was taught that when I was wrong, it meant that there was a new opportunity for me to learn something new. Being wrong, I learned, was an opportunity for me to not regress, but for me to grow. You see, I learned that failure was, again, an opportunity. Failure, I learned, was an opportunity for me to improve. And Ben, I learned through Ms. Sarkino Walker, I learned that failure was an opportunity to me for me to be able to repeat myself in order for me to change and do something brand new. Again, it was a way for me to improve. It was a way for me to grow. It was a way for me to get better. Do you desire to live for the better today? Sadly, as Solomon stated, the fool despises wisdom. The fool despises instruction. Because in the fool's mind, they are never wrong. They never make mistakes. In the fool mind, they never fail. Because in the fool's mind, their way is always right. In the fool's mind, they are perfect. How can the perfect person ever grow? How can the one that is perfect ever improve? How can the one that is perfect ever grow to live for the better? In Old Testament days, God, he sent to the children of Israel, his prophets, and he did it for the purpose of rebuking them. In other words, he did it for the purpose of correcting them in the way in which they were living. Yet the children of Israel, they ignored God's rebuke. Then Jesus came along. And during the days of Jesus, when he came with the truth, when he rebuked man in his way, the religious leaders at that point in time, they again rejected the truth. They antagonized Jesus rather than heeding God's truth, rather than heeding God's rebuke. These actions, I want you to understand that they were taken by a people that believed that there was nothing that was wrong with what they were doing. These actions, they were taken by a people that believed that they were perfect in their way. And because these people, they took these actions, they could never grow. They could never improve. They could never live for the better. 
These actions, I tell you today, that they are taken by many living in our world. They believe that they are right in their way. They believe that they are perfect in how they go about. And in doing this, many people today are unable to grow. Many people today are unable to improve. And we have a world that we have today with much strife, with much fuss, and with much mess. In order for us to truly grow, I tell you that we must first humble ourselves. We then must train ourselves to be open. We must train ourselves to be open in receiving the truth. We must train ourselves to being open to receiving wise counsel. We must train ourselves to being open to being corrected. We must train ourselves to be open to learning. We must train ourselves to be open to heeding rebuke. I don't know if you hear me here today, but I hope that you do. Are you open to heeding rebuke today? Especially when that rebuke is coming from the Lord, our God. I tell you, I encourage you today that we should always carry with us an open mind on this, our journey. We should have a mind that is open to learning. We should have a mind that is open to growing. Especially, we should have a mind that is open to heeding the rebuke when it is coming from the Lord, our God. Something that I believe that all of us should understand is that when God rebukes us, it is because he also desires for us to grow. Do you realize today that the Lord desires for you to grow and live for the better more than you do yourself? His desires, they far exceed our desires. And the Lord, he desires better for you. Not only does the Lord desire for us to grow, scripture shows us that he desires for, for, for our growth. It, again, it far exceeds our desires for, for our own growth. The Lord, he desires for mankind to grow and to live for the better. And this is something that is first shown to us in scripture when the Lord gave to the children of Israel the Mosaic law. And the reason why God gave the children of Israel the Mosaic law, Paul wrote, is because the law, it gave knowledge to their sins. You say it made their sins known to them. Now, I ask you today again, why did God give the children of Israel the Mosaic law? You see, God did not give them the Mosaic law just for the sake of giving it to them. No, God, he had, and I tell you that the Lord, he still has today an eternal desire for you and for all of us. The Lord said to Moses that he desired for the children of Israel to live by the law so that they could become a kingdom of priests and so that they could become a holy nation. So in essence, God gave the children of Israel the law to correct them in their way. You see, the Lord, he did not want them to live wickedly. The Lord, he did not want them to become a sinful nation of people. You see, I want you to understand today that being holy is far greater than being wicked. Now, as we know, Israel was unable to keep the law and God gave to the world his only begotten son. And I want you to understand again that God gave the world his only begotten son for the purpose, the same purpose that he gave the law to the children of Israel. The world needed correcting. The world needed God's rebuke. Again, scripture makes this very clear to us 
when Jesus said it himself, when Jesus said that the son was given so that those who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, God gave the world his son because he loved the world. And because he loved the world, he would not have all of us go in the way of wickedness. The Lord, he desired for you to be a holy creature. And Jesus, he, I want you to understand, he ministered with a call for us to repent. Because the kingdom of God in heaven was at hand, is what he said. God, again, he gave his son in order to correct us and to turn us from wickedness to holiness. In his ministry, Jesus pointed out that we are sinners, that we are disobedient to the instructions of God. And he, again, let us know that we, again, have all fallen short of the glory of God, but that we can be saved. With this rebuke, let us understand again that Jesus made it clear that there is an opportunity for all of us to grow. There is an opportunity for all of us to change. There is an opportunity for all of us to live for the better. If we come to the Lord, if we choose God over everything, through our faith and through God's forgiveness and through his mercy, all of us, can gain salvation. All of us can become holy. All of us can become righteous in the eyes of God. Being holy and being righteous in the eyes of God, it is far greater than being wicked. It is far greater than being unrighteous. It is far greater than living in sin. Will you take advantage today? Will you take advantage of this opportunity to live in holiness? Will you take advantage of this opportunity to live in righteousness? And I ask you, do you desire to grow? Do you desire to live for the better? Will you heed the Lord's rebuke when God rebukes you? I want you to hear that part. When God rebukes you. Will you heed his rebuke? Now, some of us, we believe that when God rebukes us, that the Lord is doing it from a place of not only anger, but that God is doing it for, from a place of bitterness, that God hates us for some reason. We think that that is why God is rebuking us. Does the Lord hate us? Is God rebuking us from a place of bitterness? Why is it that God is rebuking us? As I just referenced, God, he gave the children of Israel his law and the prophets because he loved them. God gave the world his only begotten son, as I just said from the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, because he loved the world. So I believe it is clearly established to us that the Lord, when he rebukes us, God, when he rebukes you, he must be rebuking you from a place of love. God, he must, I believe that he must love you. There is no way in my mind that, that I could believe for one second that, that when God rebukes me, that he's doing it because he hates me. The writer of Hebrews here in our key verses for, for today. Let's pay very close attention. What the writer said of God's rebuke here. The writer said there said whom the Lord loves. We see that said, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom God, what? Loves. 
He chastens. To chasten means to correct. To chasten means to discipline. To chasten, in other words, is to rebuke. To chasten means to prune of excess, pretense, or falsity. To chasten means to refine. Listen to those words. I don't know. I don't know about y'all, but chastening to me, it sounds like it's a good thing. God wants to, to refine me. With that in mind, in our scripture again from the book of Hebrews, here in the seventh verse, here in the twelfth chapter, we see the writer of this book liking the Lord to that of a loving parent. There in the seventh verse, we will see the writer ask a question. And the question that the writer asks is this, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? A loving parent, isn't a loving parent going to get on their children? A loving parent, they're not going to let their children get away with anything. D, I saw that. D, I'm there with you. That's what a loving parent's supposed to do. I know that's what my parents did when it came to me and my brother. <laughs> they, they didn't let us get away with anything. You know, when I think about how, how, how mom and dad raised me and, and my brother, <laughs> they didn't let us act bad. They didn't let us be disobedient anywhere, at home or out in public. Especially not out in public. Andrew gave me an amen. That was a death wish. If, if we was to go out and act out in public. I, I can recall mom, she just said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Good for you, mom. Dad ain't here to uh-huh right along with her, but I imagine he uh-huh. When, when we went out to the grocery store, we, when we got the Cub Foods or whatever store we went to when we was little, Mom, she would hit the, Andrew, she would hit the turnaround like this. And me and my brother, we'd just be sitting up, like, ready to go inside. And Mom, she would look and say, you better not act up. You better not put your hands on anything in this store. And boy, if we tried to act out for one second in the store, Dad was right there to correct us. Without hesitation, there was no delay. If we was at church and we acted up, <laughs> grandmama and mama would correct us. No hesitation, no delay. They would rebuke us. So me and my brother, we, we learned, we learned how to do better. We learned now, not to act up. <laughs> one of my cousins, one time, and this is about 10, this was over a decade ago, one of my cousins, she looked at me and my brother, she said, man, I never thought y'all got in trouble. Y'all never acted up when y'all went out. And when she said that, I, I chuckled, I laughed for a second, and I sarcastically, because I'm a very sarcastic person, I said to her, that's because we knew better. <laughs> and you saying, uh-huh. I said, we, we, we learned not to act up because we knew what waited for us when we acted up in, in public and at home. Oh, we definitely didn't act up at home because, again, there was no delay. There was no hesitation. But with all of that said, I, I would tell you all today that my parents were great parents. And I think that a, a lot of us would think the same way of our parents. You know, that our parents loved us. They most likely raised us all the same way. My, my parents, again, they were great parents because they didn't let anything slip by. They would correct me. They would correct my brother. They were never slow on rebuking us, letting us know right from wrong. You know, there were certain things that other kids could get away with that were my age, but me and my brother, we weren't able to do. And 
at that time, I, I would tell you all that I was upset about it. You know, I'm mad. I want to be like all the other kids. But Dee really shaking her head hard. So, Sister Hoy, you must have been rough on her. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, done, I done got older now. You know, knocking almost on the door for it now. But I, I look back on all of it now, and I tell you that I am very grateful for how I was raised. I am the man today because of how I was raised. And so I'm thankful and I'm glad today that they corrected me how they did and, and when they did. And I think that this same thing, it comes true. And I know that this same thing is true for us when it comes to how the Lord rebukes us. See, when it comes to God rebuking us, God is rebuking us because he loves us, just like how our parents loved us. And we are who we are today because the Lord loved us. He loved us enough to rebuke us, to correct us when we were acting up, when we were being disobedient, when we were going wrong. God put us on the right path. He corrected our course. As my parents were looking ahead to my future, I want you to understand today that when God rebukes you, he again is looking ahead to your future as well. As we know very well by now, God's thoughts towards us are of peace. His thoughts towards us are of a future. His thoughts towards us are of a hope. When God rebukes us, it is because of his eternal desire for us. You see, I want to remind you that God's eternal desire for us is not a desire for us to die as sinners. The Lord's desire for us is not a desire where we suffer eternally. God's desire for us is for us to live happily in peace with him for all eternity. Again, here in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, we'll see the writer here in the 10th verse tell us that God chastens us for our profit. The writer says there, so that we may be partakers of the Lord's holiness. Again, God's eternal desire for us is for us to be holy, for us to be righteous. Now, is it fun for us to be rebuked by the Lord? Is it fun for us to be corrected by the Lord? Is it fun for us to be disciplined by the Lord? Probably not. It's just like it was when we were kids. It can be rather hard. It can be even painful to know that we have messed up to the point to where God has to correct us. I would imagine that it's kind of like a plant when a plant is pruned. If a plant could feel anything, I would imagine that it would not be fun to be pruned. Imagine that it would be painful to be cut. Yet when a plant is pruned, it gives that plant an opportunity to grow for the better. It gives that plant an opportunity to bear more fruit. God, I want you to understand today that when God rebukes us, he is pruning us in a way that a plant is pruned so that again, we can grow so that we can spread out so that we can bear more fruit. In other words, so that we can grow and so that we can prosper. Isn't that what all of us want today? Don't we want to grow? Don't, don't all of us want to prosper today? Again, I hope that that is the case. So what this means for us when it comes to growing, when it comes to being pruned, there are, again, some old habits that will need to be cut away from us. Did you hear that? There are some old habits 
that will need to be cut away from us. This also means that there may even be some people in our life. Hear this part. There may be some people who aren't good for you in your life that may have to be cut away. That may have to be removed because they themselves aren't going to grow up. Those that will grow, they may remain. God may keep them in your life. But those who are of no good for us, those who clearly show that they are never going to grow and live for the better, we must let them go. I don't know if you hear that today. If you want to grow and live for the better, there are rotten apples that you better remove from you before you yourself rot. And you see, I want you to hear this today. God, because you are his, because he loves you, he is not going to let you rot. You see, if you aren't going to remove what's bad for you out of your life, that's when God is going to step in. That is when God is going to correct you. That is when God is going to rebuke you. He is going to rebuke you for your own good, for your own health. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I don't know if you hear that today. Yes, growth can be rather difficult. Yet at the same time, we must endure our growing process. We must endure when it comes to growing and living for the better. We must endure God's rebuke. As the writer of Hebrews says here in the 11th verse, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but the present isn't what we are concerned about. Said again, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nonetheless, the writer says there, afterwards, the writer says there, listen to this, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, rebuke, chastening here. The writer says that afterwards, for the future, if you will, it yields peaceable fruit of the future righteousness that we will once become to those who have been trained by it. So what the writer says there. As I said earlier, it is a good thing. It is a blessing, if you will, when you are rebuked by God. If you desire to grow, if you desire to live for the better, if you desire to truly be happy with yourself, again, I encourage you to choose God over everything. I encourage you today to turn to the Lord. I encourage you today to heed his rebuke. I tell you today that we cannot be like a fool and despise the wisdom of God. We cannot be like a fool and despise the truth when the truth is coming from the Lord, our God. There in the ninth verse, we'll see that the writer again asked a very important question. The writer we will see asked that if we paid respect to our parents and how they corrected us, the writer asked, should we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Should we not be ready to live in subjection, to live with God being our father? Should we not be ready to heed his rebuke because again, none of us are perfect. God is going to get on us. God is going to correct us for our own good. Are you going to heed God's rebuke? Are you going to be open to God's rebuke or are you going to dispute it? 
Or are you going to flat out reject it? Are you going to ignore the rebuke coming from the Lord our God? So being shown that we are wrong about something, it will certainly, again, not be fun. We aren't going to feel good about ourselves when we fall down and when we err. Yet, I tell you today that we should learn to be open. We should learn to be mature about these things so that, again, we can grow and so that we can be a better person tomorrow than we are today. Do you desire that? Do you desire to be a better person tomorrow than you are today? So we, again, must learn to be mature about God's rebuke so that we can be fit and so that we can be ready to be that better person so that we can be fit and ready for his heavenly kingdom. Yes, God is going to correct us when we are wrong. But he also tells us that his yoke is easy and that his burden is light. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. God is not so overbearing that he is a merciless God. That is not what sound doctrine tells us. You know what sound doctrine tells us? Sound doctrine tells us that he loves us, that the Lord is willing and that he is ready to forgive us. Again, even though he correct us, he is willing to forgive us when we, again, when we make the move to listen to his correction and when we make the move to live for the better. God, he is willing and he is ready to work with you so that you can be the better you. As it was for the children of Israel, it is for us today that the Lord desires for us to return unto his glory. He desires for you to return unto his righteousness. When God rebukes you in your own doings, just remember that God is doing it so that we can become holy, so that we can become righteous, not in our own eyes, but in his eyes. When God rebukes you, I encourage the same as the writer of Hebrews encouraged. I encourage you to not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when he rebukes you. You see, we ought to be open to and heeding his rebuke today because the disciplined and the obedient child, they are the ones that receives the rewards. <laughs> I remember again that when me and my brother didn't act up in the store, that's when we actually got something from mom and dad. That's when we got that Happy Meal or, or that's when we actually got that toy. See, if our parents rewarded us for our good behavior, if our parents rewarded us for our obedience, how much more will the Lord reward us for our good behavior? How much more would the Lord reward you for your obedience to his way and his instructions? We ought to heed God's rebuke today because we should all be desiring to live for the better. You and I, we ought to heed God's root today because we desire to be blessed and because we desire to be highly favored in his eyes. We ought to heed God's rebuke today because we should all desire the greater reward of his. We should all desire to dwell with him eternally. You see, if God did not love us, then he would have left us to run wild in our wickedness and in our sin. God would have simply let us act up like those children in the stores that just run around wild, acting up, putting their hands on everything. D again is laughing. So I get where D is coming from because I'm laughing at that as well. I desire for us to be good children today. I want us to, to receive our prize. I want us to receive our reward. I want all of us to live for the better. I want all of us to heed God's correction so that we can do so. So again, my encouragement for you today is this. Let us be open-minded. 
Let us be open to learning. Let us be open to God's correction. Therefore, at the same time, let us be open to being called out when we messed up. When we have failed, because when we mess up and when we fail, that's when God can teach us a better way. That is when we can learn something new from the Lord. Let us again remember that when God rebukes us, it is for our own good. God is restoring us unto the perfection that we, mankind, was created in. Amen. Amen. Amen.